title. I'll get to that later. Um, well, most of you heard me drawn on about uh, antibiotic resistance. Just so you know, it's not just me. The World Health Organization <laughs> considers this one of the greatest <laughs> threats to, to human health today. And uh, I would put it second only to climate change. And I, I'm not going to give a whole big background on this because I talk about it so much around the school. Hopefully you're all aware. Uh, but I will use this one projection, which is that if we do not change our, dramatically change our trajectory, that, um, that by 2050, one person will be dying of drug-resistant infections every three seconds. So uh, it will, it will um, the death toll, the annual death toll due to antimicrobial resistance is projected to be more than what kills cancer each year in the United States uh, today. So, uh, and I just heard, you know, the leader of the team that did this estimate, Jim O'Neill, who coined the term BRIC, the BRIC nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China. Um, and he said, you know, based on the, the emerging data that's coming out, that that was an underestimate. I believe it. So, you know, of course we want to change trajectories. So if you think about changing trajectories, uh, there's a lot of different things. We need new drugs. We need... We need alternatives, we need clean water. Um, but one of the key things that we need is to use the antimicrobials that we have today better. And, um, but if you look at where they're used, it's, it's hard to know where we should focus our efforts. I and mean, I think we should be thinking about all of the places. But you know, one of the big debates is how much antibiotics are being used in animal production versus human medicine. So this is the, our most recent estimate for, for what's being used in human medicine, and it's not controversial to say that um, a big chunk of that, you know, maybe as much as 40%, is unnecessary. So we're, we're giving antibiotics too often in human medicine. Um, this is what we're using in animal production in the United States, and this is the amount of the same classes of drugs that we use in animal in human medicine. So the 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 number is actually much larger if you include drugs that we don't use uh, for treating infections in people. So the the antibiotic selection here that's happening in animals can directly select the bacteria that are resistant to the drugs that we use in human medicine. Um, this is seen as a really big potential problem and one that I've spent a lot of my career studying. Um, but we still have this big question that's unanswered, which is you know how much does this Antimicrobial use in animal production affect people, or another way to put it, you know, what proportion of antibiotic resistant or antimicrobial resistant infections in people can be attributed to antimicrobial use in animal production? I'll just tell you, I think it's unquantifiable. It's an ecological problem. Um, it's it's they work synergistically, but even though I think that, <laughs> I have to start to chip away. We have to start to chip away at this this number to inform policies, to help people prioritize how they, they work on this issue. And so I, it's important to recognize that human health can be infected, affected both uh, by direct infection, so the bacteria that evolve in animals that are resistant to, to antibiotics spread to people and cause infections. There's also horizontal <coughs> gene transfer, so the, the bacteria and the animals evolve new resistance mechanisms uh, on mobile genetic elements, and those mobile genetic elements can be passed to bacteria that may be better adapted to animals to pathogens that are really well adapted to humans and then cause drug resistant infections. So that's how horizontal gene transfer can, can affect the problem. I'm going to talk about direct infection. That's the, our group um, here at GW spends a lot of time looking at this. Not that we don't think that horizontal gene transfer is important. And if you look historically, um, we've really, when we've been thinking about this problem, we've been thinking about the classic foodborne pathogens, Salmonella and Campylobacter. And I love this stuffed animals because it just shows how weird microbiologists are that we would have diarrhea causing bacteria and cuddly little stuffed animals with stupid eyes on them. But um, I have these. So, uh, so you've all heard of Salmonella, but Campylobacter competes with Salmonella as a top cause of bacterial diarrhea, foodborne bacterial diarrhea. And so when the CDC tells us that, um, that these cause over 2 million cases of diarrhea, we know that we're not very good at handling our food. And when they tell us that 410,000 of those infections are resistant to antimicrobials, that can be drawn to either historic or contemporary use of antibiotics in, in animal production for one, but largely to that, 
to that uh, cause. Now, there's been some really important studies uh, showing just how dangerous and uh, the direct impact on human health of antimicrobial use in animal production. So this is uh, this was my doctoral advisor, Ellen Silbergelt, did a review a few years ago. I might have actually been co-author on this too. I can't remember, but. Uh, but she showed that in Spain, when they introduced fluoroquinolones into chicken production, fluoroquinolones like Cipro, uh, is Cipro is part of that class, when they introduced fluoroquinolones into poultry production there, they saw Cipro-resistant Campylobacter infections shoot up. And they just kept going up, going up, going up. And, uh, and they, they hadn't seen Cipro-resistance in humans until they did this. And in the United States, what we saw was they, they saw, we saw the exact same pattern, no resistance until we introduced it into broiler chicken production. Then we start to see this rapid rise. The FDA takes on, they say, all right, this is clear evidence based on what we saw here and in Spain. We have to stop this. Bayer fought them for five years. Um, and meanwhile, resistance kept coming up. And then they finally got the ban, and uh, resistance just flattened out. It didn't go away because it's a single point mutation in one gene. So there's no counter selection. So we're stuck. The genie's out of the bottle. But at least it didn't go up to you know, virtually 100% as it did in Spain. Now this is a, a, looking at it on the other way, from the other direction. This is my, probably my favorite study from Lucy Dutel uh, from Canada, where they said, all right, let's stop. Let's ask the Quebecois broiler chicken producers to stop injecting chicken eggs with cephalosporins. So they would inject chicken eggs with cephalosporins. Those are the chicken eggs that go into the hatchery that then hatch into chickens that we then eat. So they stopped, you know, please, they said, please stop doing this. And they just voluntarily did stop. Canadians are really nice. And so they said, okay. In the first quarter of 2005, they stopped. And what happens was you see uh, cephalosporin resistant salmonella plummets on poultry products. This is cephalosporin resistant salmonella in people. Salmonella infections in people also plummets. And just to show that it's not just some weird strain thing with salmonella, this is E. coli, cephalosporin resistance E. coli in, uh, on poultry products also plummets. So this shows that you can have a direct positive impact. And it's not even just the, it's not even the feeding the animals the antibiotics, but we're talking about injecting chicken eggs before they go to the hatchery, before they hatch, get fed whatever they get fed, and then go into the food supply. Really compelling evidence, but of course the industry argues against it. And that's just in two years. Yeah, very rapid. <coughs> so, obviously a strong counter selection. Now the problem is that our really good looking clip art doctors don't care about, <laughs> don't you wish your doctors look like this? Um, sure, you can do that to me. Um, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Sorry to the doctor. <laughs> um, but they don't really think too much about salmonella and Campylobacter. Not yet, anyway, because most people resolve, self-resolve, right? So you, you know, you're sick for a few days, you use a lot of toilet paper, you get rid of it. They think about extended resistant, uh, extensively resistant tuberculosis, gonorrhea. Um, they think about ESBL, extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing E. coli, or carbapenem resistant carbapenem resistant uh, enterobacteriaceae, or, or CRE, um, Klebsiella or E. coli, and methicillin resistant staph. Now, I, you know, I'll tell you, I think it's pretty clear that uh, extended resistant uh, gonorrhea has nothing to do with animal production, at least not, maybe in Germany, but not in here. That's it. Um, so uh, this really has to do with people not adhering to, uh, you know, good safe sex practices and all kinds of other things. Um, this has to do with complete failures of, of public health systems in the developing world and our sort of our view in the developed world, not recognizing um, that by not helping these countries reach their sustainable development goals and control these kinds of infections, that these will come back and haunt us someday. But so we'll take those off of the list as potentially being related to animal production. But then there are these bugs. These are colonizing opportunistic pathogens, E. coli and Staph aureus. They belong to a whole group. Uh, we coined this term a couple years ago to help people understand 
We've talked about opportunistic pathogens for years, but these are the kind that can grow in your gut or in your nose or in your throat for days to decades without any symptoms. But when they get introduced into another body site, like E. coli, into the urinary tract, or Staph aureus in the blood, that they can really cause problems. And so, and we've seen that resistance has grown very rapidly in the colonizing opportunistic pathogens, and, and we can become these reservoirs, these walking reservoirs, unknowingly uh, sharing these bacteria with other people. And when we go travel to another country, we can come back colonized and then go visit grandma in the hospital or someone and share those bacteria. These cause insidious epidemics, so uh, as I mentioned, asymptomatic uh, colonization, indefinite uh, colonization periods, uh, you have human, animal, and environmental reservoirs, and uh, silent person-to-person -person transmission. I like to point out that most transmissions are silent, <laughs> with the exception of maybe those gonorrhea. Uh, <laughs> uh, but there are lots of POPs, lots of these colonizing opportunistic well, pathogens in the food supply. And so we've been doing studies for years looking at, wow, there's, there are these bacteria out there. We're just ignoring them, thinking of them as indicator bacteria. But since they're not classic foodborne pathogens, we don't really pay attention to them. And so uh, we've done a lot of work on staff. I'll save that for another day. I've presented it before in the department. But E. coli is uh, my current favorite bacteria. I'm very critical, but this is my current favorite. And from a, from a, you know, there are thousands and thousands of strains of E. coli. Uh, <laughs> that's supposed to look like Boris from uh, the UK. Yeah. That's not <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just in England, you know. Uh, they have the same haircut, you know. So, uh, so, so there are thousands and thousands of strains of E. coli. So E. coli have been with us since before we were humans, right? So they've been <coughs> colonizing vertebrates and diversifying all this time. And, but from a clinical standpoint, there's the benign, the kind that we all have in our gut, or most of us have in our guts. There's the diarogenic kind. So think about Jack in the Box in the early 90s. Uh, e. coli 0157 kills, uh, you know, 100 people a year, roughly, in the United States today, now that we've had some uh, improvements in food safety. And then what I would call the super bad uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, that causes lots and lots of urinary tract infections. And when I say lots, I mean, these things have special abilities. They can attach to your urethral cells. They can cloak themselves from the immune system. They can produce toxins. They can do all kinds of stuff that allow them to cause bladder infections, uh, deal with uric acid. Six to eight million a year in the United States. Uh, at least a quarter million uh, kidney infections. So you start in the, in the bladder. If you don't control it at the bladder and it's an aggressive strain, it can get into the kidneys. And once it's in the kidneys, it can get into your blood and kill you. And it, they kill, these have to be killed like 40,000 people a year in the United States, at least. This is an old number from 2003. That number's almost certainly gone up. Uh, and then antibiotics are critical to prevent those, that ascent from the bladder to the kidney to the blood with the aggressive strain. So I just want to make sure everybody understands this, because I didn't know it. As a microbiologist, I didn't know it until I started working with my colleague, Jim Johnson, from the University of Minnesota. <coughs> e. coli caused most urinary tract infections, so 85% at least. So E. coli and the UTI-causing strains live in your gut. Um, and then they make a short trip from the anus to the urethra. That can happen through lots of different ways. Sex is an uh, awesome way. Um, but, you know, it's a short trip, and then they can set up this infection. And then, um, and then so the question is that we've been having, well, how do those UGI-causing bacteria get into the gut? And this is, this is one place where we think these bacteria are going to come. <clears throat> and, uh, and so we've been doing a lot of population-based studies. And so one study that I'll, I'll briefly tell you about is that we, in 2012, for the entire year, we collected, uh, we collected E. coli, or sorry, poultry products, let me just show you. In Flagstaff, small geographically isolated town. Um, we collected all brands of chicken, turkey, and pork from all the grocery stores in the, in the city. By the end of the year, we collected uh, you know, nearly 2,500 products. And then all the urine samples from the only hospital in the city, which is Flagstaff Medical Center. And so nearly 1,300 isolates there. Um, this is Flagstaff. So I lived there at the time. And I was like, ah, it's so boring here. But hey, wow. Well, we could actually do a cool study here. And so we did that. Um, 
And then, so from those 2,500 products, we, 80, 80 plus percent of them were positive for E. coli. So we got nearly 2,000 E. coli isolates. I mean, isolate E. coli from something we call it an isolate. And then uh, 1,300, as I said, from UTIs and blood infections from the LA hospital in the city. We sequenced the genome, so this is one of the next gen DNA sequencers. And we started asking this question, you know, what percent of human UTI E. coli uh, were the same strains as what we found in the meat? And so this, we did this through a four-step process, and, and this was, a, you know, at the time, an unprecedented scale study, and we're still dealing with it. <laughs> but, uh, so it's a four-step process. We sequence the genomes, um, and then we extract from that sequence data what's called an MLST, or multi-locus sequence type. So this is a sort of a high-level DNA fingerprint. It was the gold standard before we had uh, whole genome sequencing, actually, um, which allows us to subgroup the, the isolates and then have really high resolution phylogenetic trees, which is this whole genome, WG, uh, SNP, single nucleotide polymorphism phylogenetics, or phylogeny, for each sequence type. Sorry, lots of abbreviations. When, when we're in the second part of CE, I'll tell you not to do that. <laughs> um, and then we, what we're doing, so this is a new addition to what we've been doing, and this is why you know, I invited you here today. I wanted to talk to you about this. Overlaying these trees with host adaptive uh, genes is really helping us to learn more about the epidemiology and evolution. So from those, from those uh, nearly 3,000 isolates, I guess more than 3,000 isolates of E. coli, we had 446 different sequence types. So I said it's very diverse, right? Three, three types from a clinical standpoint, but very diverse in terms of sequence types. Each of these numbers is a different sequence type. The size of the bubble represents how many isolates had that same sequence type. And then the color represents meat if it's red, we got it from meat and uh, yellow if we got it from urine. Huh? Clever, right? Okay, so, so you can see that there are some epidemic strains in humans, some epizootic strains in animals, and, uh, and then a smattering of, of lots of other different sequence types. This is a new strain. Uh, our colleague uh, Tim Johnson, that I'll talk about later, uh, has, has been watching the emergence of this, rapid emergence. And our group, along with Jim Johnson and others, uh, has have been uh, describing the evolutionary history of this rapidly emerging pandemic clone that's now resistant to all but just a couple of drugs and has in and, and 25 years has gone around the world and kills tens of thousands of people, uh, probably hundreds of thousands of people today around the world, at least 10,000 in the United States. So. <clears throat> Those are the different sequence types, but when we look at their, this is an evolutionary tree. Um, I won't go too deep into how we look at how we look at these trees, except to say that um, that this is a tree that's been ordered in terms of uh, evolutionary history. So it's rooted, and um, and so most ancestral is back here. Each of these little nodes represents a theoretical common ancestor to all the things that are connected to it. And uh, what you see is that we have this, we call it a clade, right? All these are groups. So all of these sequence types, so this is one isolate from each sequence type to see how they're related to one another. They all share a common ancestor. And you see that they're disproportionately in animals. So there's some, there's some historic relationship between those that tend to be in animals. And then those that tend to be in people, so mostly gold, mostly gold, um, tend to group together as well. But you, you can see clearly that there's a lot of, that there's also overlap. So they are bleeding, they appear to be bleeding over, even though um, these have been probably in animals for a long time, these have been in humans for a long time. And so I told you we do, uh, we sequence the genomes, we do sequence type analysis to group them, and then we do really high resolution trees for each of the sequence types. So I'm just gonna show you one. We have trees for 56, the 56 sequence types that are overlapping. So 56 of the sequence types we saw in animals and people that had at least four isolates, right? There's more than that overlapping, actually. Um, and so we drew, let's, I'll show you a high resolution phylogenetic tree for just ST131. So previous studies had suggested that there was no food relationship between ST131 and people, and uh, yeah, there's no, there's no <coughs> food source. 
But you see this big bright red pie piece, so we were pretty curious about that. Um, well, it turns out that when you do uh, a high resolution phylogenetic tree, this is under the tree, just to show the clustering, uh, that you do see parts of the trees where they're just pure gold, right? So pure human clinical isolates. Uh, and then other parts that are mostly gold with one exception. And then you see this part of the tree where you see a mix. And these have been labeled, these different branches have been labeled uh, with something called a thin H type. This has to do with how they attach to cells, right? So a thin beret. And this is a really important one uh, epidemiologically, or, or it's a, an important virulence factor. And so it turns out that the H22, thin H22 allele, um, you see animal or meat isolates and human isolates grouped together. So what we did then was, um, and this is working with Malita, who's in the back on a way. Malia's a biotransist that I've been working with for at least 10 years, she's amazing. Um, so what Malia did, then did was picked out all of these and said, all right, let's make a new SNP matrix that is like identify all the SNPs that are shared, uh, or at bases that are shared among these, uh, these isolates, and let's do a really high resolution tree. And so that's what we had here. So we were then able to order those and understand direction of evolution, and, and we saw that while we had some clusters that were clearly you know, separated from the meat isolates, other human clinical isolates were clustered very closely with meat isolates. See these guys here and these guys here. Well, we thought we had it, right? So this is, this is great. But the, so we wrote up the paper and we submitted it and then the reviewers came back and they said, wow, but there's, look at these branch lengths. There are mutations separating these. This is not an epidemic. Um, these are, uh, we don't know, uh, we don't know the relationship between these guys. Um, and who gave it to whom? And so, uh, you know, it's a little frustrating, um, but it was a good challenge for us. And so we went back to the drawing board and, and I, I just say this is, you know, we struggle to cope with the enormous underlying diversity of the E. coli populations in, in food animals. So just think about this, right? So this is the way we raise our animals. If you wanted to get, if you wanted to really sample this house, there's 100,000 birds in here. If you wanted to sample and understand E. coli population in that house, how many, how many samples would you want? Nate, how many samples would you want? <laughs> oh my gosh. Do <laughs> yeah, a ton. They don't weigh much, actually. Probably not a ton. Um, but, um, lots of samples. Lots of samples. Um, well, they're not very dense. Okay. So I would want. To, I'd want a lot too. And then think about poultry production across the United States. We produce nine billion chickens each year. That's just chickens across the country. This is the broiler belt overlaps the Bible Belt, interestingly. Um, and then we have a little bit over here in California. Um, 8.9 billion chickens, right? On thousands of farms. So think about how many, how many you wanted from that one farm, and then how many would you want across the country? It's, it's impossible to sample sufficiently. So I think it's important to point out that we're using tools best suited for outbreak investigations. And outbreak investigations usually involve a young bacterial clone. So that is something that's just recently emerged. And you know, think about how bacteria replicate, right? A single common ancestor gives rise to a population that then in a food uh, contamination situation gets disseminated across the country from a point source. Um, so it, be, it looks something like this. And so we can start to trace those back in time. We can do epidemic curves, and we can hopefully pinpoint them back to, as far back as we can get is to a slaughter plant, uh, because uh, they, the industry prevents us from having any on-farm data, actually. So we can trace it back. Um, but most of the E. coli that are growing in animals are these diverse, old diverse clones that have been diversifying in the, the La dolce vita of, of animal production life, right? Just all these hosts just sitting around, getting fed constantly. These guys are diversifying, <coughs> crazy. And so instead of this, you have this, right? You have you have these things bleeding over, not epidemically, but sporadically, but lots and lots of bleed over, potential bleed over. 
So I this this brought me to this question. Like, wouldn't it be? I always want an easy answer, right? Wouldn't it be great if they just wore uniforms? Just so I put out a request. E. coli, please just start wearing a uniform to tell me where you work most of the time. And so Forrest Gump was very influential on my life. And he said, uh, remember this where he said, those look like comfortable shoes? He said, Mama always said you can tell a lot about a person by their shoes. Where are they been? Where are they going? All right? <laughs> I thought about this. Wow, if we had some shoes for your whole life. <laughs> well, then I thought about my buddy Tim. Uh, Tim Johnson, University of Minnesota Vet School. So Tim, let me tell you about Tim. So, um, Tim is a professor. He's got an R01 script, Jay Graham. I introduced him. Um, a University of Minnesota Vet School, veterinary microbiologist. He's a plasma, very famous plasma biologist. He's been studying plasmids. These are these little pieces of DNA that bacteria share, and they can help them adapt to different environments. And he's a snappy dresser. Look at this guy. So if anybody knows about like poultry fashion, what kind of shoes do you want to wear? This guy would know it. And so he told me about avian adapted Colby plasma. So it turns out that these are these little pieces of DNA that bacteria can copy and share, right? They keep a copy for themselves, they pass another copy to another E. coli. And these plasmids help E. coli thrive in the poultry environment. But no, most people have been thinking about them in terms of virulence factors, like, oh, these, are, these help bacteria cause disease in, in poultry. But we started looking at the prevalence of these in our chicken E. coli from our big Flagstaff study, and they were 63% of the E. coli from chicken, 63% from turkey, only 5% from humans. This, this, these are the shoes that E. coli wears when it's working in chicken. Those are great shoes, aren't they? Do you have a pair? Okay. So, other th the other thing that's cool about these is that when you grow E. coli up in uh, rich media, this is LB broth, it's a uh, rich media that we grow E. coli in, they're not stressed at all. They hold on to that plasma. See that green line? Um, the, this is percent of the population that's carrying that uh, cold E. plasma. If you grow them up in chicken litter, a slurry of chicken litter, they hold on to that plasma. If you grow them up in the chicken cecal, cecum contents, they hold on to it. If you switch them into a mouse cecum, they kick out that plasma. So it's unstable outside of that chicken hose. So just like us, you know, when they get home, they kick off their shoes, right? And, and so this could be really informative. And this is going to blow your mind. This, Look who is playing Mr. Rogers. Forrest <laughs> Gump is playing Mr. Rogers. <laughs> all coming together. Right? I mean, this is just amazing. Okay, so I think the, the instability of Colby plasmids outside of the avian host could be really informative for epidemiologic investigations. And so if you think about this, uh, so here's our E. coli wearing its chicken shoes. That's what I was doing during faculty that? meeting today. Okay. <laughs> during faculty meeting today. And you follow them over time. As I said, they hold on to those shoes, right? Um, if you grow them, though, in, uh, and we're doing the experiments right now, so we could replace him with a mouse right now, because that's all we actually know right now. But we, theoretically, we anticipate that if you grow these over time in people, that they're going to lose those shoes, right? So in that new environment, a, a more stressful environment. And as I said, Tim is doing those experiments right now. Then, if, you, if, if this woman comes into uh, the hospital and she has a urinary tract infection, and we get a urine collection from her, and we culture out E. coli that has these chicken shoes on it, then we can, we can not only, I think we can not only start to say that, that it probably came from chicken, but also it was probably a recent transmission because it still has those shoes. So that's what we're digging into right now. And we're, we're, we have a grant due on Wednesday to, to really delve into this. So we could start to say, maybe she got that E. coli from chicken. OK, so now coming back to this tree, right? So the reviewers didn't like this. But then we overlaid the tree with the coal V plasma. So this, this is a little round symbol to represent that. What we found was almost all of the poultry isolates, the E. coli that we got from poultry products, had the Colby plasmid. So did the human urinary tract isolates that were most closely related to the poultry isolates. This to us was super compelling evidence that not only did they get these, these infections from probably poultry product exposure to poultry products, 
but that it was recent, that this has not been circulating in human population for very long. And it turns out that the reviewers agreed with us, and, and so that was quickly accepted, and then it's been highly cited, and, and was the top read paper in MBIO that year. Yay. I'm looking at Malia. Do, do you suspect that in time the shoes will fall off the, yeah. the human? Yeah, so um, which, which comes to differentiating host spillovers from host switches. And so, uh, thank you for priming me. All right. I think, you know, it's unlikely, well, I, I'll show you that it is untrue, <laughs> that this is the only host associated accessory element. So um, let me tell you about E. coli genome. So E. coli are really interesting. They have what we call a semi-open uh, genome. So an average E. coli has 4,700 genes in the genome. Um, the pan genome, if you look at all this, the isolates that have been sequenced to date, you know, we're pushing 60,000. If you look at all of those E. coli and ask which one, how many genes are shared among all of those, it's only around 2,200. So we're talking about, you know, like, close to 60,000 accessory genes. And it's probably that these accessory genes probably underpin E. coli's ability, partially underpin E. coli's ability to call in so many different vertebrate hosts. Um, and they may also be invaluable epidemiologic tools. And so one of our premises is that over time, E. coli populations undergo simultaneous diversification and conservation in food animals. Now, this is, these are two totally different patterns, so what, what I mean here. I mean that as they, as they grow in that very uh, welcoming environment of a chicken host, you know, where there are 100,000 birds all crowded together, they're just going to, they're, they're not under stress and they're just going to, they're just going to get mutations. They're going to accumulate mutations in their DNA, which makes it really hard for an epidemiologist that's using SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, to understand relatedness. However, we also anticipate that because they're trying, they have to adapt to that chicken host, that they're going to have a conservation of the accessory elements that are associated with success in a chicken. So you might have very diverse lineages, but they're all going to share, or many of them are going to share things like the Colby plasmid. So they might be very diverse, but they'll have, oh, they'll all have the Colby plasmid. Does that make sense? So let me use my, my uh, nurse example to help explain this a little more. So historically, you know, um, nurses were all white women in white outfits, right? But over time, they've, you know, as the industry has grown, as we've grown as a society, um, they've diversified. But they still wear pajamas to work, right? <laughs> and they still wear the matching pajamas. They all still have those outfits. Um, and so, I think that, well, I think that this is an analogy for that, right? Um, and then one of our major goals is to then differentiate between host spillover and host switch events. So a spillover is when you have a big source, you have a source of E. coli over here, animal production for instance, and it's spilling over and it doesn't take up long-term residence in the, human, in the human ecosystem, right? So it just takes up enough residence to cause a disease or it just passes through eventually, we shed it away. But a host switch means that it's jumped and it starts to become adapted to that new host, right? So it's not only going to shed those, those elements that were good for chicken, but they're going to pick up elements <coughs> for the human host and, or whatever the new host is. And so I think a host spillover, you can think about the nurse going into the grocery store, right? So she's still wearing her pajamas, or sorry, her work outfit. And so you would recognize her. You'd say, oh, there she is. But she's not working in the grocery store. She's just there temporarily, right? Now she can buy some stuff, so these, these he or she, sorry, um, uh, can be, you know, just taking a trip to the grocery store. However, a host switch, if you think about that, they quit their job, and now they're going to take on the, they're going to work in the grocery store. They want to work there, so they're going to start, they're going to take off their, their blue pajamas, and they're going to put on the, the bib that the, the person wears at the grocery store, right? Or they become a butcher, right? So they get the tools of that job, right? So now they have this knife and this, and this bib, and so, by looking at those things, the loss of those, uh, you know, the, the, the nurse outfit and the gain of these things, you'd see a host switch event. Is that, am I losing you with the analogy or is that working? Okay. <laughs> All right. So another premise is that I think that only host spillovers are actionable in food animals. So if there's been a host switch, if they're now established in people, we can't do anything about them. And the antibiotic use in animals is irrelevant anymore. 
right? So now it's, it's just whatever's happening in people is affecting them. However, if they're still spilling over, and we see some really virulent strains that are spilling over actively today and causing disease, then we can go to the animals and we can vaccinate or try to eliminate those, those hazardous bacteria in the animals. And it turns out that the bacteria that are causing urinary tract infections in people also cause disease in the animals. And so we can come together and we can say, all right, these cause us problems, these cause you problems, let's put our forces together and let's try to eliminate these. Let's, let's put some investment into this. And so that's where Tim and I are really, you know, we work together to try to find these co-hazardous strains, I guess. Um, yeah, and after host invention event, it's too late. So I will just point out that empiric biological discovery is too slow. So the reason we started using Cold B was because Tim has worked on it for decades, right? And he knew that this was an important plasma. But we can't wait for these guys to, to do that kind of discovery. And so we, we want to flip that on its head, and we want to find a naive approach to just find these elements. And so we've been using a comparative genomic-based approach of all of our 3,000-plus genomes um, and asking, asking the data which genes are associated with, with which hosts and, and uh, are not associated with hosts just based on lineage. And so we have found now um, 46 different multi-gene elements, so, so operons and, and plasmids and, and all kinds of stuff, associated with different hosts. They make sense in many cases. Like some, one of the cool examples that we found uh, was, a, uh, was a, a couple of genes associated with using um, sugar sugar replacement, so um, like not saccharin, but I can't remember the name of the sugar, but an alternative to sugar that you'd only find in humans. And it turns out that the E. coli in humans carry those genes disproportionately. We've also found some other avian virulence genes. So we found, uh, found different hosts that differentiate poultry from humans, chicken specifically from humans, turkey specifically from humans, pork, and then also humans versus the animals. And then so if you look at that, this is that same tree in just a slightly different order of the different sequence types. And the gold, the gold uh, dots are host, human host associated elements. And the red dots are animal host associated elements. And you see that this is the animal part of the tree, right? And this is the human part of the tree. And so the patterns really <coughs> do hold up. And, and, um, and this is the SC131H22 tree that I showed you before. And what you see is that these, these human isolates that are most closely to the closely related to the animal isolates carry more of these um, animal associated elements and not the human associated elements. These are just plasmids here. So I naively, I do a lot of naive things, uh, but I just have ideas and then Malia has to tell me, oh that's <laughs> and Cindy helps me all the time. Okay, so I naively thought that um, we could find all these markers and we could get our sensitivity up to like 100%, right? Uh, but it turns out I was forgetting that you're also losing specificity with each of those markers. So what's really happening is that with each of these markers, we start to bleed over more and more to the human isolates. And so that kind of sucks, right? But you can start to counteract that with your human-specific uh, markers. But uh, this guy, anybody know who this is? Bayes, right? Bayes. So Dan, who works in our lab, Dan Park, um, said, hey, I think you can use a Bayesian approach to, to use all of these markers together without losing necessarily your specificity. And then he used to work with this guy, Jinka Wu, at University of Michigan. And uh, Jinka said, yeah, you can do this. And I already have a model written for it. And so we've been working together with these guys, uh, not him, he's dead. Um, <laughs> to, to develop a Bayesian-based approach. And, and, and so this is Dan. I love Dan's a really good thinker and, and uh, has these great analogies. And so I was like, explain to me again how this Bayesian thing works. And so he said, all right, so, so you want to you wanna figure out what's the likelihood that this hipster here is a coffee drinker, right? Does she like those coffee beans? Well, you know, let's say 60% of the population drinks coffee. So right off the bat, you know, your probability, you know, you have a pretty good probability there, um, she works in an office. People working in offices uh, are more likely to drink coffee, so that shifts the, the what they call it, posterior probability over slightly to the right of being a coffee drinker. Um, if they have a coffee mug on their on their desk, that also shifts it. But people can drink tea too. I was just in the UK, and they're like, "Wait, we don't use that for coffee." 
Uh, but if it says, I love coffee, that's a real giveaway. Right? Um, um, but this person didn't have that. But if they had a coffee grinder, oh, almost certainly. Or if they go to Starbucks, there's a chance. But they also start, sell other stuff at Starbucks. But so uh, she didn't have the coffee grinder, but she went to Starbucks. We shifted over a little bit because they do sell tea and other nice snacks, and they have free Wi-Fi there. Um, however, if you do find that coffee grinder, then the, the probability just moves way over, right? And even though these are not, a co not everybody's going to have a coffee grinder, so the, the, the sensitivity is pretty low, but the specificity is very high, and it does have value in, a, in a, um, an evasion model. And so what we've been doing is, is taking all of these markers that we've been identifying and trying to understand our uh, net sensitivity and specificity. Um, this is uh, one minus, but one minus specificity. And, um, and we're going to try to bring these all together then to, to assign an isolate. So if we find an isolate in somebody's urine, we can assign a probability that came from human meat. And then maybe even get more refined, like specifically poultry meat, specifically chicken or turkey, or specifically pork. And we anticipate that you know, some isolates would have different probabilities. And these would be really valuable for epidemiologic investigations. Um, and then the time to loss data would also be informative, right? So if we start to time how many generations it takes before they kick off those shoes, then we can start to put a window of time when that transmission took place. When did that spillover take place? And when does it become, all of a sudden, a host switch? But, uh, so we are also developing a separate model for this. And so I, I'm going to wrap up and just tell you a little bit about some of our, our study sites. So uh, some of the people from the team are here. Uh, we're doing a big study in California where we're trying to uh, assess the, we're trying to quantify the transmission of E. coli from um, meat to people there and, um, and then see what happens um, to susceptibility or resistance with the implementation of something called Senate Bill 27, which was supposed to restrict antimicrobial use in animal production. We don't think it's very, being implemented very well. Um, and then another study site is Iceland. Uh, anybody been to Iceland? You should go to Iceland. All right. uh, again, um, Iceland is great. And, and it's a really cool place to, to do studies. Uh, for one, it's geographically isolated. It has a small population. Single-payer universal health care system, single hospital servicing everybody, really collaborative agencies. They've, we've already got a collaborative agreement. They give us isolates, data. They're really, they're really transparent. They've sequenced all of their citizens, so eventually we can start to understand that, too. Um, uh, outstanding water sanitation. And they've prohibited the importation of fresh uh, raw meat for 30 years, which has really been a barrier to people bringing in meat. And so this is a... You think about, we should be, I, I want a real world context, but I want a simplified real world context to start to understand the rules, and then we can layer on the complexity by going to someplace like Taiwan. Right? Well, it turns out Iceland also has the lowest resistance rates in all Europe, right? So by far compared to someplace like Italy or Greece. Don't go to Italy or Greece. And, I mean, you should go, that's beautiful, but we're going to come back colonized with somebody. Else. So, yeah, the mountain is very happy there. But it turns out that they have pretty average antimicrobial use in human medicine. Interesting, right? But they have really low, second only to Norway, uh, antimicrobial use in animal production. So, why is resistance so low in Iceland? Um, antibiotic use in human medicine, average. Geographic isolation, yeah, but they get two, they get two and a half million tourists every year and a population of 300,000 people. You know there are no with this. Um, and they tour. They, half the population goes abroad to Italy every year, so bringing home uh, crap, right? Um, they have excellent hygiene, but that's not unique. I mean, that's, that's throughout Northern Europe. Uh, other options, periodic consumption of pickled puffins, disgusting. Really disgusting, prevented bird? shark and bird schnapps. The yeah. Bird? Bird. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they don't taste very good, I can tell you. Um, that's certainly unique, but probably doesn't have anything to do with their resistance levels. But they have extremely low use in food animals and then no importation of fresh meat. I think that these two could be playing a role. So uh, the problem is, so we've been, we, we knew this was coming down the pike, so the EU said, you can't do this. 
you know, you're part of a free trade agreement, you have to allow the importation of fresh meat. So they're finally coming down on them. I think it's funny because they say, because we have universal rules applied on, in terms of antibiotic use, and so you should, you should feel safe. But if you look at, there's a hundredfold difference between Iceland and Cyprus in terms of antimicrobial use, right? And Italy, too. And so they said, basically, you have, to, you have to stop this. So the bottom line is that they're going to have to start importing fresh meat. And so we are poised to assess this, because we've been collecting isolates there, samples there, for two years, and uh, have all the agreements in place. And so the grant that we're putting in uh, right now will uh, be able to assess this. So you know, finally, I mean, I think you know, one of our big goals is to quantify, right, uh, that what is, the, what is the impact of this antimicrobial use in animals? Um, versus humans. I don't think that it breaks down based on this. You know, the, the, there's a straight relationship between 70% of antimicrobials used in animals relates to 70% of drug use and infections in people. That's almost certainly not true. But we have seen the emergence of new, very important resistance elements clearly in animals that have been, sw that have been swapped into animal or to human pathogens and are now causing lots of problems. And so I think the bottom line is that we should decrease all use, but we still have to chip away at that number. So um, I don't have the whole team that works on the California study, sorry, but uh, I didn't talk about your data yet, so saving you guys for the next slide. Uh, but we have this great, great team, and, and I always have to thank uh, Cindy and Molina in particular for working with me for so long. <laughs> and then uh, Dan has really brought some new stuff to this in terms of the, um, in terms of the Bayesian models. So, yeah, 